Welcome to the Get Your Act Together podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and I am so excited today to welcome James Hipkin. James, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Kelly. I'm really, really happy to be here. So can you tell everyone uh, about your business and what you do? Well, these days, the past 10 years, we've been building large corporate websites, um, use big projects, custom work, lots of sophisticated back-end stuff, um, often six-figure budgets, that kind of thing, which is kind of a roundabout way of saying we actually know what we're doing. <laughs> um, and lately, last four or five years, um, I've been focusing on extending our knowledge base into smaller businesses. Most smaller businesses can't afford to work with us, but when I looked at the absolutely god-awful websites they had, they should be working with us. So I created a product called Innately, uh, which is a website subscription product, which allows smaller businesses to take advantage of our knowledge and expertise. That sounds wonderful. So um, I have taught myself WordPress a bit and I've built my own website. So please be kind as you go through this. <laughs> I have, uh, that is not where I have invested uh, so far, um, but it's getting to the point where there is no strategy and uh, <laughs> um, I can understand why you need one. So I'm very excited to talk about that today, uh, the, the digital marketing strategy behind this and creating websites. Uh, so yeah, I'm very excited to <laughs> you to be here. <laughs> and you've you've twigged on the most thing that I see most often when I audit websites, and I'll probably audit three or four websites a week. Um, the most common thing is an absence of strategy, and that's where I think we can really help. My background in marketing and and marketing communications and experience with big brands, big agencies multi seven figure budgets, that kind of thing has given me a lot of knowledge that I can draw on. And I translate that knowledge into principles. And because principles are universal, it doesn't matter what size business you are, the principles apply. And um, so that's, that's the knowledge that we're bringing to website design and development. I'm not a designer. I am not a developer. I'm a business person with a marketing background. And so our emphasis is on strategy because that's the piece that's most often missing. Yeah. Yes. I hear a lot about design and about having to figure out WordPress or whatever website you're using. Um, but yes, the strategy, I think, is the thing that I hear very little about. Um, right. So, And I'm very interested to see this because I think, especially if you kind of scrap together your business uh, and over the years, you, like. You put up a web page for the thing you need this week. You're you're going to yep. sell something. You create a web page, but uh, the overall look or feel uh, is lost. So, can you kind of walk us through some of the ideas on strategy? What should be included? What should be not included? Where where does the strategy start? I guess. Well, another common way I'll describe this issue is most websites are inside out. They're talking about themselves and shouting out to the audience. People don't want to be shouted at. A much more effective way to think about it is outside in, where you put yourself in the, in the thought processes of your best customer. Who is your best customer? When I do a website audit with a business owner, we'll spend more than half the time not talking about the website at all. Because until I really understand who their best customer is and what their buying journey is, I have no objective basis to make comments on the website. How, yeah, right. How can you be building something to talk to these people if you don't know who you're talking to? Exactly. And you don't know what they're looking for. So a, a really good example of inside out versus outside in is there's a, a, an advertising copywriting formula called PASS. It stands for problem, agitate the problem, solve the problem. And the PASS copywriting framework is a very effective way to think about what you should be doing on the homepage of your website. Don't lead with your solution. Engage the audience by leading with the problem that they are trying to solve. So their instantaneous reaction is, yes, that's what I'm looking for. Right? 
And once you get them engaged, they're much more likely to be receptive to your message about the solution that you have to offer. So you want them to see themselves there. Like, see wait, themselves that's me. There. That's right. Okay. And, and another common thing that I'll see that, and, and I'm, you know, Don Quixote's got nothing on me. I'm trying to get people to stop saying call to action. Okay. Right? And people look at me and go, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what I would rather you say is you need to create a pathway or multiple pathways on your homepage. Effectively, it's the same thing. But the shift in mindset is really important. A call to action is the marketer shouting at the customer and telling them what to do. A pathway is an invitation to continue on your journey. And we're going to customize the content because you're telling us who you are. So it's more of a choose your own adventure instead of yelling. Yes. All because right. most businesses have two or three sub-segments in their target audience that represents the vast majority of their sales. I'll give you an example. I coach a, a professional public speaker. She gets She's a paid keynote. She, people pay her $10,000 to come to their event and speak to them, right? When we really dug into her target audience, she, she had three target audiences. There were event managers who are basically super project managers, very rational, very buttoned down, very clear and specific needs and goals that they're trying to accomplish. She also did a lot of work with corporate HR directors who would bring her into the corporation to teach the executives how to be better communicators. She also did a lot of work with senior executives, mostly female senior executives, who suddenly have found themselves on stages and they didn't know what to do. So she was coaching them. Okay, it's all public speaking, but three very distinct audiences, demographically, attitude, what is their pain and what is their gain? Very distinct. I would think you would speak differently to all three of those people. Exactly. And if you call them out with pathways on the homepage, when they select that pathway, two very important and profound things have happened. They've told you exactly who they are and they've given you permission to give them more information. So instead of trying to quote unquote, sell them, yes. you are, they've said, this is what I need. And this is, and you can say, oh, okay, well then I can help you solve that problem. Yes. And, and my other adventure, my other Don Quixote venture um, is I'm trying to get people to stop saying sales call. Okay. Uh, all right. So tell me what you would rather call it. Cause I don't like sales call either. <laughs> it should be an enrollment conversation. Oh, I like that. That, that right? seems not yucky. <laughs> it's not yucky. And it it is it is taking this, I am I am my marketing needs to create value for the customer as well as the business. And if I'm supporting the journey, the buying journey that the customer is on, then the next logical step in that buying journey is an enrollment conversation. You want to get it to the point where it's the most logical thing I could do next would be to sign up for this thing. Mm, I love that. I, I love that. Yeah. Cause I, I don't like the sales call thing. It, it like, especially if you uh, sign up for something and it says I've signed up for a sales call. Like I I'm waiting to be bombarded by pitches. It's exactly. And nobody wants to be sold. No, no. But people want their, another line that I'll sometimes use is, People don't buy what you're selling. People buy a solution to their problem. Okay. Everybody nods their head, which is what <laughs> you're doing right now yep. <laughs> when I say that, but they don't do it. Right. So start thinking about your marketing as its purpose is to support the journey that your best prospect is on. And, you know, Funny thing happens when that hap when you do that. When you get a customer, you get a customer for the right reasons. They're much more likely to be a loyal customer. Yes, because I feel like anyone that um, gets sold into something 
one, there's that buyer's remorse. They are always questioning whether this is the right decision and they end up not being in alignment. Like you, you, it's not a good customer. Like right. you, you end up fighting it all the time. It's always a problem. Right. And it, a lot of these ideas came from experience I had back in the, I was an executive vice president at an agency in Chicago. And one of my, uh, ma my main client was a large telecommunications company. And this is pre-cell phone. They were, this was long distance calling. And there was a massive amount of churn going on in the industry. So my client sponsored a research study on loyalty. Why, why were people not loyal and why were people loyal? And the researcher they hired to do this was an expert in this. This is what his firm did, is they did loyalty research. He said something in the preamble before he even presented the results of the study. He said something that really stuck to me and really was the germ that started a lot of this thought process. He said 90% of loyalty problems can be traced to a flawed sales process. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the start of that relationship. And right. if you're promised something and it doesn't deliver, or you just feel like you're getting, you know, shafted in some way, you're always going to feel on edge. Right. And, and what creates a relationship? What creates a relationship is the exchange of value. And if you can generate value that goes beyond the functional and transactional benefits of your product or service, then you're creating relationship equity, right? It's a simple mm -hmm. financial idea, but, yeah. it, but it applies. And that relationship equity is what takes you from being a product with a name and starts to have you become a brand. Yeah. I'll... Because brands have relationship equity with their best customers. Right. And we hear that all the time about building brands, even yeah, if you're not selling something. Everybody talks about building yeah. brands. Like everybody <laughs> talks about you need a call to action, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But nobody thinks about it. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that we take for granted. Okay. Yeah. So what do we, how do we build a brand? I don't know, James, how do we build a brand? <laughs> By creating value that goes beyond the transactional and functional benefits of the product or service. All right. I love it. And and I, I love this idea It's of providing service. Like I have skills that can help someone in their business and their life, and I can help those people. And that is much about, about how I think of trying to um, interact with customers. Right. I can help them, right? I can help them. and why wouldn't I? Right. So instead of being like, I've got to sell this many things, like that seems yucky to me. It's, it, I don't do well with that. I don't like closing the deal, weird scripts, all of that. Like I don't do well with it on either side. I don't like it as a customer either. If I'm put in a call where I made to go through a sales pitch for 40 minutes before I can say yes or no, that to me is yucky. Like I don't mm -hmm. want to be in it either way. So I love this idea of serving instead of selling because I can help those people. And those people, and in my line of business, they usually are a mess and they do need my help. So, right. <laughs> And another very effective way to help people is attraction is very important, but it is equally important to repel the folks who aren't a good fit for you. Yes. Yes. And I think that has been one of the best um, unknown benefits of this podcast <laughs> is that people get to come and see how I talk and how I am and what I am about. And if I'm not for them, that's it. They yeah. don't get on a call with me, which great. We just saved ourselves a lot of time. Yes, exactly. I mean, one of the most effective sales tools that I have is the word no. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how often, even to my, with my existing customers, I, they'll, director of marketing at a major corporation down in Los Angeles that we've been working with for a long, long time, calls me up and says, gives me this idea that they want to explore. And I'm like, you know, really like to take your money, but that's a really bad idea. Let me explain why. Right. And I go through the reasons why it's a really bad idea. And he's furiously taking notes. He says, great. Now I know what to tell my boss. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> yeah. They've been a loyal customer for seven years. Yeah. I mean, the word no is it's hard in the beginning when you're trying to get your business going because you're like, I just want to, I need cash in the door. Sure. I'll do this weird thing that you're asking me to do. And then as you build your business, I think people forget that they can start saying no. Like yes. now you have business coming in and the work isn't always what you want to be doing or right. serve either one of you. Right. And, and no is a trust event. When you're saying no to somebody, you're building trust because that's speaking honestly to them. Because sometimes it's not a function of they're not a good fit. Oftentimes it's a function of they're not ready yet. Mm -hmm. A very effective marketing funnel technique is the quiz funnel. Where you use a quiz at the top of the funnel to, you know, it's fun, it's light, but it helps find qualified prospects who are at least in your pool. But at the bottom of the funnel, you put in, you use an assessment survey. And an assessment survey is a much richer, much deeper, much more involved process. Might take 20 minutes to complete, 30 minutes to complete. You have to think about it. It forces you, the prospect to really be thinking about the business problem that they have. And what happens out of that assessment survey is the right folks have sold themselves mm. on the right on the next step that they should take with you. And the wrong folks have also convinced themselves that they're not quite ready yet. That's great. But in a way that just says you're not ready, not go away. Yeah, it's not it's not passing judgment. It's just saying that right now, you know, you still have some work to do. I I send a lot of people for our, our small business product innately. I send a lot of people away. We're focused on six-figure businesses who are or who want to be using digital marketing to drive growth. If you're just getting started, if you're trying to figure out how to get lunch money, <laughs> yeah. we're not the right, we're not a good fit for you. That doesn't yeah. mean we won't ever be a good fit for you, but you need to get some traction. The website's not the thing that you should be spending a lot of time and money on right now. You need to figure out what your product is and, and will it sell? And is there a market for it? Right. You have to get some money coming in the door before. It. Yeah. I see a lot of people starting, um, especially as virtual assistants, starting out and they've got, I don't know, $4 to the, their, their revenue line. And they're like, well, I'm, I'm going to pay... Uh, someone to give me a whole new brand and a whole new website. Right. No, don't do that. So, so when do you think uh, that kind of thing comes in? When do you think that you should start focusing on investing in branding or website or those kind of things? Well, the the best way to create a brand is to sell something to somebody. Right. And because if it, it's all well and good for you and your and your, you know, your spouse or your mother to think that this is awesome, but is somebody that you've never met before willing to pay money for it? Do that first. You know, and, and there's lots of temporary and, and subscription things you can do real fast and, and relatively inexpensively, Squarespace, Wix, you know, some of the third-party education platforms, um, you know, Teachable and Udemy and, and you know, all that crowd. Um, great place to trial things. Inexpensive, easy to set up, fast. Now, the caution that I'll share is don't build your business on rented land. Right? If you're using one of these third-party services, you don't own the land that you're building your business on. It's a very important point. When you get to a certain point where, okay, we've, we've got this figured out, that then it's time to start taking all of the value out of what you've learned and applying that and start transitioning across to properties that you can own. And you basically only own two things in the digital space. You own your website and you own your email list. Everything else is rented land. 
Right. So, you know, t- Facebook goes away, Twitter implodes. Um, or or, all of a or sudden. somebody, yeah, if Twitter implodes, that's a great example. <laughs> or, or Facebook changes the rules. It or they lock be, you out. Or they lock you out. Yeah. Or, you know, it used to be with Facebook, you could do organic social media and, and 50, 60% of the people who were following you would see your content. That's not true anymore. Yeah. And they didn't call you up and ask you if that would be okay. Right. They do what they want for them. That's and right. we get to figure out how we can use that for our benefit. But right. yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people get caught out because they had most of their invest. They built their entire business on Instagram and then right. the algorithm changes and then their, their funnels completely dry. Right. Right. I had a client who came to me. He would, he built his, he, you know, was, he was doing a lot of dodgy things with SEO. And then Google did an update and suddenly his website was vanished. Wow. Right? Yeah. I'm fascinated by all this because I've, I, I, like I said, I've kind of patched this together um, and I have a very small list, but I'm, I, I've always kind of, I was referral based for a very long time and we are doing a lot more marketing now and learning so, so many things <laughs> as yep. we go. Um, and I will say so many people are pushing social um, in all the ways, because that's how you sell things. And I'm hearing you say that that is obviously less of a, a, a thing that you should have in your strategy. How much of your strategy is website list? How much of it is social? Um, what, where do you think that you should be putting most of your focus? That's a great question. And it's a very common question. A lot of smaller business organizations struggle with this. And if you think about it, I'm pulling up some props here, which is, th- this is a, the hub to a bicycle wheel. Okay. Right? It's nice, but by itself, it's basically a paperweight. These are spokes. They're also nice, but they don't have a whole lot of value. And I've got a rim here as well. When you put them together, you have a wheel, the most profoundly important invention in mankind's history. Digital marketing is the same thing. Digital marketing tactics in isolation are expensive noise. The power comes from the connections. So your rim of your wheel is your content and messaging strategy, and it is driven by your customer avatar. The spokes are your digital marketing channels. Social media, organic social media, paid social media, SEO, email marketing, even your retail location in this day and age is a spoke. The hub is your website. That's the place where your value is emanating out from and where you're drawing people back in to the website. You're using your messaging and content strategy to hold it all together. I, I love this visual you have put together because that makes so much sense. It's all right. coming back to this main point. Um, it's that all you coming own. back to this main piece of it, this main, the hub. And when you think about how a hub works, it generates a lot of leverage. An individual spoke in your bicycle wheel has no real strength. But all of the spokes together with the rim and focusing their energy into the hub is very strong. Right. It's it's the same concept with digital marketing. If you can, the power comes from the connection. So choose the digital marketing channels that are going to get your message out to the right people at the right time and then draw them back into the website, which is real estate that you own to create value that goes beyond the functional and transactional benefits of your product or service. I love that. And I I love bringing it back to a place that you own because that's how you're going to build that business, right? Right. uh, You know, your list, being able to talk one-on-one to a person. Right. Instead of uh, that third party in the middle saying, well, we're going to change everything. And now you're not going to talk to that person directly anymore. Right. 
or you're putting all this energy into into creating the the the, the most perfect Facebook or Instagram post you could imagine and 12 people see it. <laughs> yes. And that's what I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone was pitching, telling me to, you know, putting all this stuff on Instagram. And I'm like, but I, it's an enormous amount of work. Yeah. And then like, no one sees it. And then like, it just seemed very um, futile, I guess. <laughs> right. And it, and it has a, a shelf life of seconds. Seconds. Most of this stuff is 24 hours. I'm like, I just yeah. did all of that work and no one's going to see it ever again. Right. Yeah, that seemed like the silliest thing ever to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you can also, if you are willing to accept that, you can, and you using your analytics can be really important. What I will, LinkedIn is the primary channel that I use because I'm t- primarily targeting, I'm primarily business to business. So I'll look at my analytics and I'll look at a post, I'll go back three, four months and say, what posts four months ago got the most traction? Right? I'll grab that content and I'll repurpose it, you know, do a little bit of light editing to it, stick a new visual on it, post it again. Yeah, I think that's also important to say because I feel like a lot of people are like, well, I already said that. And you're like, but not everyone heard it. That's right. And not every, and even the people who heard it don't necessarily remember it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's, yeah. You know, you, you are just a dot in the swirl of dots that are going on in somebody's life. It, you know, I, again, this is another example of inside out versus outside in. From the inside, you're completely surrounded by all these things that are important to you. But all of these things that are important to you in the aggregate are barely even a dot on the horizon of your prime prospect because they've got so many other things that are worrying them. So many. I mean, think about like around Christmas, I, I was getting hundreds of emails a day. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't even, I couldn't read all of those. Like if, if you only had sent me one email, I never would have seen it. Right. Which is why I'm sure I got 3000 emails, but being able to like see past that, you have to say it more than once. Right. And be, and have confidence and consistency is also very important, you know, for, I can't tell you the number of times I've had a customer reach out to me and I haven't spoken to them in three or four years. And they reach out and say, Hey, we're, we're, we're ready to start a project. I want to talk to you about it. And I'm like, Oh, so, and, and they'll literally say, yes, I, I follow your emails. I, you know, I see them come through. And even if all they see is the subject line and the preview text, it reminds them that we're still there. It reminds them of the, and when they're ready, Suddenly they'll be prepared to listen. Yeah. So it, consistency it, is also very important. And I think it and it's hard because when you're speaking into that void and there's mm-hmm. no one actually talking back to you. And then all of a sudden I had I was on a, a call with it was a coffee chat and they're like, Oh, I know all about everything in your life through your podcast. And I was like, Oh, you actually li- I thought it was just my mother listening to it. And you know <laughs> all of this stuff. I was like, oh, you are people are listening. And it's hard when you are putting all of that stuff out and you're not getting any feedback. Yep, that's right. It is but, it is hard. But you know, my background is consumer packaged goods. Um, you know, n- nobody has a relationship with chewing gum. <laughs> right. Right. And and yet chewing gum is is an important part of, of, you know, it's those brands are successful for a reason. And a lot of it has to do with consistency. And that's, and that's, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to believe that it's worth it because you're not going to see the results. Like I posted twice. I'm not a millionaire. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, and you, but look at large, like uh, CPG companies like Procter and Gamble are uh, there's lots of case studies out there how they don't stop their advertising. You've heard the line above the line and below the line. But where that comes from is above the line expenses are fixed expenses. Your okay. rent, right? Mm-hmm. Your okay. core staff salaries, all those sorts of things. These are above the line expenses. Procter & Gamble always felt that advertising was an above-the-line expense. Well, it makes sense, right? You can't stop. Right. And regardless of the economic situations, they would maintain their advertising budgets. And you know what happens? They are constantly and consistently reminding people of the value of their products. And good times and bad, 
their market share is sustained and growing. That's a good point. I mean, and I feel I, I have read that it's often the things that you're doing now that are what works, the payoff, I guess, in the next three to six months. Right. So you kind of have to have the faith that That's right. it do. will be it will be down the line that you're going right. to kind of see this stuff change. Now you also, but you, you, you know, the, the definition of insanity is not a good marketing strategy. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so it equally on the other side of that teeter totter, everything in life is a teeter totter. It's got to be balanced. You've got to also be critical and, and self-assessment is important. And, you know, there was a, a, story of a guy named Peter Lynch, who was the uh, fund manager at the Magellan Fund, a big mutual fund, very successful. And a business interviewer was interviewing her him for, a, for an article and asked him, so what do you attribute this, your success? And he was expecting a long and complicated, involved business answer with graphs and charts and various things. And Peter Lynch responded and said, water the flowers and prune the weeds. That's wonderful. I love it. I'm a, I'm right? a big gardener. So that goes, I, I, I understand this instantly. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing your marketing, you know, you want what you have to be consistent and you want to be, have faith in what you're doing, but you want to also be self-critical and assess what you're doing. And if something is working, do more of that. Where do we know that we've given it enough time? Because I feel like a lot of people try a thing. It doesn't work instantly. They give up. They try a thing. Like I, every time I talk to certain people, they have a new thing. And I th right. I'm like, you didn't even give the last thing a chance. So how right. do you, can you tell when you should keep going or when you're like, nope, this isn't working and you need to cut it? Uh, I, there isn't an easy answer for that. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, it was a kind of a trick question, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it's, but just don't try to boil the ocean. You know, yeah. pick a few things and do them as best you possibly can. And when you think you're doing them well, figure out how to do them better. There's an old direct marketing concept called beat the control. Direct marketers were constantly testing things. Right. They'll have their control. They'll have their the letter and the package and the you know thing that works. And then they'll do small cells of with a new headline or with a new offer. Okay, does that beat the control? If I'm getting a five percent conversion rate on the control and my new offer is getting a six and a half percent conversion rate. Huh. Well, that's worth looking at more closely. Yeah. But you don't instantaneously throw out the control and replace it with the new test. You run the test again with maybe a bigger sample size, a confirmation test to see if, okay, was this a fluke or was this real? Right. So it's it's about discipline and you know, you know, figuring out what's working. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, you know, I know that email marketing is working for me because I, as I said to you, I get these calls from people out of the woodwork, three, two years, three years down the road, suddenly they're there again. So I, I've got that, that flower needs to be watered. You know, uh, meanwhile, I'm testing other things, constantly testing other things. In terms of okay, I've we try this, we'll try that, but but not on a big budget level, just small to see if it's okay. Is there get am I getting some traction from this? Huh. Well, that seems to be working. Let's let's put a little more energy into that. Got it. Yeah, I, I, it was kind of a trick question what I asked you. <laughs> There's okay. really no, no really real real uh, way to tell, but it, it is a trick question, but it's also a fair question. Yeah, I think it's the, it it's the question that, we have all the time. Absolutely. And yeah. you should have it all the time. But I think it, there's, there's no way for you to answer it. We kind of have to answer it as we, as we go. Well, yeah. and the, the key answer is, you know, avoid the shiny new thing. You know, oh, yes. And, and if you've got, if you want to have anything, get yourself out of outside, you know, 
be empathetic to your audience. Never mind what you think. Where is your, what's your audience doing? Let them tell you what they're looking for. You know, I, I see this frequently. People will, you know, my nephew told me I needed to be in TikTok because it's very cool. <laughs> right? Yep. I hear that I, a lot. I, I, I got nothing against TikTok, and, but I'll look at them and go, you're a CPA. Your audience is all over 40. They're not on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. And that's letting the audience drive the decision versus the shiny thing that flew by. Right. Just because someone else is doing a really great job over there doesn't mean that you should be doing it, especially if it's a place where your people are not. Right. Yeah. Right. My my daughter, who's, who's now a, a product manager in a marketing technology company in San Francisco, um, we, when they were growing up, of course, we'd made them crazy because they're, they're like, but, but my friends are doing it. Right. Uh, yep. I Every parent that. in the audience <laughs> yeah. is going, I've heard that. Yep. <laughs> and my, our standard response was we don't do things because other people do them. We do things because they're right for us. Yep. That's great. My mom was like, well, I'm not her mother. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't happen here. Yeah. Yeah, yep. everyone, everyone's gotten that. <laughs> yep. So tell me about the Oreo cookie strategy. Okay, so the Oreo cookie strategy is a, this is a great segue from what we've been talking about because our, our main work is custom work that we do usually as a subcontractor for design agencies, right? Presidents and owners of design agencies talk to me all the time. Uh, I've been in the agency business for a long ass time and much to my wife's surprise, people like me, um, <laughs> right? And so I, I, they talk to me and I hear, look, I can't make money on website projects. They become this lost leader for me in a black hole. And it's the same problem. So I came up with the Oreo cookie strategy and I'll actually in public speaking situations, I'll talk about the Oreo cookie and I'll literally put Oreo cookies in everybody's seat in the auditorium. And the Oreo cookie, an Oreo cookie has three parts. It's got two outer crusts and that real tasty center, right? Yeah. The first outer crust is the discovery process. And it's the piece that oftentimes design agencies don't do or don't do very well. And that's where you're, and it's dull and dry and boring and, you know, not very exciting, but you need to really dig into the functional requirements of the website, all of the stakeholders in the com client company, you know, the, can't tell you the number of times that we've been a week away from launching a website and suddenly somebody in HR says, I need to recruit employees. Right? We don't oh have any my. functionality in the website for recruiting employees. I need that. Oh my. At the last minute. Right. At the last minute. So you want to dig into the functional requirements, to speak to IT, speak to finance, speak to HR, speak to all the constituents in the organization. What are they looking for from the website? Speak to your audience, speak to your customers. What are they looking for from the website? Really dig into those functional requirements. Functional requirements lead to technical requirements, right? If, and I'll give you a really obvious example. We, we need to sell stuff on the website. Okay, well, that suggests that the technical requirement is a shopping cart. Okay, makes right? sense. Yeah, makes sense. Logical. So... If we're going to be building the website and we're using WordPress as the CMS for what we're doing, then we're likely going to be using WooCommerce. Well, WooCommerce has some very specific outputs that it generates, right? So that be, those functional requirements lead to the technical requirements and the technical requirements lead to the sitemap. The sitemap, and this is the first crust in the Oreo cookie. The tasty center 
is where the designers get to take all of this information and actually turn it into something pretty. pretty. <laughs> yeah. With a and and where the UX is being considered, the user experience is being considered, but they're not doing it in a vacuum. They've got a very clear architectural drawing of what it is that the how the website is supposed to function. Functionally, technically, and the sitemap. Right? Makes yeah, that makes sense. You want to know right? what you need before you build it. Yeah. Which makes the design process both more effective and more efficient, right? Now, and the other crust in the Oreo cookie is the development. That's where if the functional requirements and technical requirements and sitemap have done, been done well and the design has been developed using that architectural structure, then the developers are not guessing. They're yeah. not trying to figure out, well, what do you mean by this? Well, you know, what, we can't do this because this needs to connect to that. That when that wasn't considered, that's not in the design. And now we're going to spend twice as long having to go fix it because no one told us in the beginning. And then the d designers are like, well, I didn't make a color for that or whatever the thing is. Right. And then all of a sudden your, your whole plan goes to crap. Right. That's right. And it's not profitable. And when you pursue the Oreo cookie strategy, you can actually produce a website profitably. If you're an agency, you can produce the website profitably and it will be better quality product. I love this idea. I love, well, we talk a lot about making agencies profitable because so many people have this problem, right? They, they yeah. offer a service and then the, it gets completely out of hand mm -hmm. and they have no idea how to get it back. And then they make absolutely no money for themselves. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is you can charge for the discovery process. This is not something you just throw in. Right. We, like you, you're doing that work for it, <laughs> you know, and we'll charge a good amount of money for it because that's where our intellectual property is being applied to these business problems that the client is bringing to us. So we're charging for that. Right. It's all of your experience to know how to get through that whole thing yep. and to know the questions to ask and how to best prepare them. So right. that is something you should be charged for. That's your, your expertise. That's right. I'll give you a, an example. We, we rebuilt the website for the North Lake Tahoe Tourism Association. And this had been a whole litany of offshore people. And, and, you know, you can imagine it's a committee and it's, and there was 30,000 pages. Oh my. And the design agency wanted to bring this down to about 300 pages. I, I, I could see why. <laughs> no right. one's going to read 30,000. However, we raised our hand and went, yes, but has anyone done an SEO audit? Which of those 30,000 pages are actually contributing to your page rank? to your site rank, to your domain authority. Has anybody done that? Much silence. Because you know the ones you would cut out are the ones that you needed. Of course. <laughs> because it's subjective. There's no objective information. So I pushed them to hire a, somebody who knew what they were doing, made some recommendations, and they did the SEO audit. And my God, if they had followed through on what they were planning to do, it would have been a disaster. It's amazing. And we ended up cutting it back to about 6,000 pages. <laughs> Much more manageable amount, Much I guess. Much more manageable. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you know, but we also understood another piece of this. I'm going to get a little nerdy on you here for a second. Hit it. Hit it. Go ahead. 301 redirects. Mm-hmm. If you're transferring from an old site to a new site, you need to put in 301 redirects to move that old page to the new location. Technically, that's not hard to do, but you want to also be very aware of what was that old page ranking for and does the new page have similar content? Oh, okay. Right? Yep. Because Never really thought about redirecting that way is not enough as far as the Google bots are concerned. That redirect has got to match. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it needs to 
be more or less the same Mm -hmm. as the page it was before, just in a different spot. That didn't really ever occur to me. There you go. Yeah. And these are the things that people pay you for because it didn't occur to me. And I'd be like, oh, well, we'll just redirect it over there. Right. And the other thing about redirects is redirects are not free. Just because they're easy to do does not mean that they're free. When we first did the redirects for that North Lake Tahoe, the redirect process itself was adding four to five seconds to page load time. Oh, wow. Every single time the page is asked for, the browser has to go through all of the redirects. Uh, Well, I mean, it makes sense, but you don't think about it like it would take that much. And five seconds doesn't seem like very much, but anyone who's ever clicked on a website page, it doesn't load instantly. Yeah, it's a lifetime. So what you want to do is you want to figure out, okay, so which of these pages are really important to me? Which of these pages are also the destination for a backlink that's important to us? Those are worth redirecting. The others, probably not so much. So there's, you know, you, it's a filtering process. So when we went through the filtering process, we knocked it back down to, I think it was a second and a half by the time we were done cleaning things out. Still too much time. The other thing about redirects is redirects are not permanent. They don't need it. I know it's called a 301 permanent redirect, but it doesn't have to be permanent. Because once you've submitted your sitemap, and once that sitemap has been crawled a few times, and once pay, Google's figured out where all of the new pages are, you can take down the redirects. The only huh. redirects that you need to maintain are any redirects that are that, that you've got backlinks coming into that you don't want to lose that bank backlink, the domain authority that comes from that backlink. Got it. Okay. Yes, this is all things that I've slowly taught myself little by little, but I don't have that overall strategy like we talked about at the beginning because I've kind of said, okay, I need to do a thing. I go yep. look up how to do a thing. <laughs> I yep. build the thing and it may or may not work with everything else. So right. like that, that idea of having someone come and talk to me and look at holistically as a thing um, that is a wonderful reason to have someone help you with your website instead of just making it up as you go along. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's why, you know, our, our audience is folks who are, you know, have, have gotten some traction, have gotten some success, and now they're ready to up their game. And that's where we can create a lot of value is for folks that are, you know, now, now I need to get serious. Now, now I've, I've really got a handle on this. Now I need to make this thing really sing. So that's when I need to bring in somebody who, who, you know, actually knows what they're doing. I love it. Yeah. I'm now you have my brain like, okay, all the things on my website that I, I know are a mess right now. James, thank you so much. This has been enlightening. Uh, I love to talking about all of this and can you tell everyone where they can find you? Well, given how important your website is, a great way to connect with me and we can have a wonderful conversation about who your best customers are, the journey that they're on, and how they interact with your website. Because the reality is you have six seconds or less to engage a website visitor. So if you go to sixsecondsorless.com, you can book a free website audit with me. And we'll talk about your customers, we'll talk about their journey, and we'll look at your website in that context. And we'll apply the six ways that you can engage a website visitor in six seconds or less. And we'll apply those principles to your website and your audience. And it's always a valuable conversation that generates a whole lot of head scratching and doesn't usually necessarily involve a complete reworking of the website, although sometimes, um, but it always creates value. So six seconds or less.com. I love it. I'm, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom today, James. Um, thank you for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure. And I will see everyone else next week. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you have an agency or want to create one, come join my Facebook community, Get Your Agency Together, where we talk all the things growing and scaling your agency.
For show notes and more info on all the things, head over to ReynoldsOBM.com. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook at ReynoldsOBM. And finally, if you enjoy this podcast, I would love for you to give us a review on iTunes.